the third meeting of the general plan subcommittee is called to order thank you mr. mayor I'd like to welcome you all to our number three meeting and I'd like to thank the committee members for all of the prep that it takes to go into um, getting ready for these meetings and for attending workshops. I'd also like to thank the public for attending the meetings and the workshops and for writing in and for reaching out to us. All of the comments have been so, so helpful and, and so enlightening on the issues that face our city going forward into 2040. So I'd like to have the roll call, please. Commissioner Lee? Oh, present. Commissioner Roberts? Here. Commissioner Daniela? I'm here. Commissioner Rodriguez? Here. Commissioner Baldwin? I'm here. Vice Chair Levine? Here. Commissioner Bowery? Present. Julia, can I turn it over to you? Hi, uh, my name is Julia Klein, uh, the city's uh, project manager for the general plan update effort. So for those in the audience today, uh, tonight's meeting is um, focusing on the draft vision statements. Charlie Knox with PlaceWorks, uh, the general plan lead consultant, will provide a brief presentation about the vision process and also show the draft vision statements. So at this point, the meeting is going to be open to public comment, not on the agenda. So anyone that would like to speak during this time period, please forward a card to the end of the table and your name will be called and you will have two minutes to speak on the non-agenda item. If your item appears to be in line with our visioning process, I will gently ask you to hold your comments for the general visioning plan public comment period. We're hoping that by doing this that we will uh, enable everyone to speak, uh, including public and the committee. And I would like to say right now, too, that as we get through the agenda to the visioning public comment period, if everyone who would like to speak to the items on the agenda would please fill out a card and turn it in now because this is what we use to gauge our timing during the meeting and the time period that each speaker will receive to state their comments. If those of you who choose to speak after we have finalized that timing period, then we will hold those cards until after the committee has had a chance to speak and answer questions among themselves. And then if there is time, we will come back to a public comment period after that fact. So please fill out your cards now and forward them to the table and we will proceed on with our meeting. Are there any speakers on the public comment period for those items not on the agenda? So are we proceeding then? Okay, there is no comment, no public comment on items not on the agenda. So we will move. Sorry, there's one. I turned in a slip, but I said I wanted to comment. So. And, these, and these comments are not pertaining to visioning. Oh. Correct. OK. My name's Karen Harrell. I attended one of the workshops. I think I must have attended one of the uh, very poorly attended workshops. Um, and I, I just wanted to make a comment or two about the process up to this point that has led to the visioning statement. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you now and this is pertaining directly to what's on our agenda tonight. I'm not with, going to talk about the, the content, I'm going to talk about how you got here. And that's fine, that is included in what we're okay. discussing on the agenda, so we'll make sure you have time to speak on the visioning portion of our public process. Comment. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. <coughs> Are there any other non-agenda items that people would like to speak to? Okay, we're going to close the public comment period and we're gonna move into our new business, which is our draft vision statement. I'm Charlie Knox from PlaceWorks, a consultant that's helping the city and the community with the general plan. I'm gonna be very brief 
and just kind of recap how we got to where we are um, with all of your participation in person, online, by email, et cetera, and then get into the content of the vision statement, which is really going to be the discussion for the community and the general plan subcommittee tonight. That was the agenda. That is the agenda for tonight. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, just a quick reminder, and one of the things with the slides you'll see throughout this process, we repeat some of the slides so that when people go to the website and pick up the most recent um, presentation, some of this is repeated, so you don't have to go back through several months ago to find out the same information. This is all covered earlier. So I'm just going to briefly talk about what the general plan vision statement is why it's important, how we got there, and what's next. So the vision statement, um, as many of you know from participating either online and or in person, is um, a description of what you as a community member, what the community would like to see San Mateo look like in 2040, um, and maybe even before that. Um, the point of getting as broad community input as we can is to try to find and coalesce and identify shared values that make San Mateo special and will make it special in the future. Um, the general plan, as you probably know, relates to pretty much everything the city does in terms of governance, concentrating on land use and circulation, conservation, open space, noise, safety, parks and recreation, but um, really all these things pertain to quality of life in the city and the community. And so the idea about a vision statement that sets the course and the frames the guiding principles for the process for the new general plan is to try to get that shared community vision and values. Oh, uh, one quick note on the side. There is this progression as we finalize the vision statement with planning commission and, and um, city council and general plan subcommittee. Um, it will lead also to um, framing the, the general plan land use map that shows where things will go in the future, but also the goals and policies that the city will carry out to try to make that a reality. Here's the process to date. Um, we started in September. We had a series of meetings, including neighborhood meetings. We had uh, community workshops that some of you attended. Um, we had an online exercise for several months. And here we are tonight with uh, the general plan subcommittee number three. And then uh, in, the new, in the very beginning of the new year, um, your comments and the general plan subcommittee's comments will go to the planning commission and city council for their consideration and acceptance and modification if necessary. So how did this work? So we collected community input in a number of different ways. About 500 individual respondents responded online. That doesn't include um, many emails that we also got, city staff got. Um, and then those of you who, who attended the in-person workshops probably recall we had statements about what, would you, what do you like, what do you not like, what would you want to change, and then we went into these small group exercises um, to try to focus those comments in specific ways. And we looked at major themes, housing, circulation, et cetera, and then came out with statements from each of these groups and then tried to coalesce that all together. So you can imagine we had quite a lot of work to do um, to take everything we heard. And in your packet tonight is not just the draft that city staff and the consultants have tried to put together as a starting point, but there's also every single individual comment we received. Um, so you can look. Look for yours and look for others that you think might be interesting and, and informative, informative to you. Um, so with that, really what we're going to be looking at tonight, um, they say never wordsmith at a meeting. <laughs> Hopefully we won't, we won't feel that way after tonight. But, but the reason the words are so important and the reason that the general plan subcommittee um, is going to be discussing this amongst themselves and with your input and, and um, comment is these words are important. They really help frame how the city will carry out policy in the future um, as, as focused as where streets might get um, traffic calming or um, where infrastructure might be most important to prioritize for repair or for replacement. So these are, these are not small words, they're, they're important ones and we really want to make sure and the subcommittee really wants to make sure that we truly understand the community's perspective and are, are Achieve, are, are creating a, a way to achieve that as, as easily as possible by accurately reflecting what, what we've heard. So I won't, just, I won't read these all, they're, they're in the packet. We're gonna go through them probably one by one um, at the behest of the chair. But uh, you know, it, there are 12, nine, 12 of them. Um, and they each pertain, at least one pertains to those topics that we looked at back at the 
um, at the workshops and also on, and that's just, this is how things were divided online also. So with that, um, I'll just talk about next steps. So we talked about the general plan land use map. There's also a circulation map that goes, that dovetails with it. So it's not just about where things go in the future, but how you get from one place to another by various means of travel. Um, these are the words that will be complemented by those, those maps and graphics. And again, they will also guide the goals and policies that are in the general plan. So this is a key step in terms of getting ready for the general plan land use map, getting ready for the, for the uh, goals, policies, and, and actions that the general plan will, will uh, direct the city to, to, part, to uh, undertake. So um, I just want to thank everybody, all 484 people, I think, that we, that, or 484 responses we got online. We got lots of emails. We had a lot of people um, at our workshops. Um, some of which were very well attended. And so um, with that, I'd like to turn it back over to the chair. And I'm happy to answer any questions from the committee if that's the committee's uh, um, desire or we can wait until later for that, for that input. Okay, so now that we have had an overview of the draft vision statement, I think what we'll do then is open up um, the public comment period and then we will discuss among ourselves by the various portions of the draft vision statement. And it's an awful lot to cover in a very, very short amount of time. So can you tell me how many speaker slips we have? I have 12 in my hand, but there's, I think there's a few guys. Okay, if anyone has not turned their, their yellow speaker card in, please do so now to be considered for this period. Okay, why don't we plan on everyone having two minutes to speak? If you feel you can do it in less time, feel free to do so. But at two minutes, I will ask you to bring your comments to a close so that we can move on to the next person. And please come to the microphone here. And um, would you like to call the first speaker? Uh, first speaker is Gene Condon, and he will be followed by Karen. Good evening, my name is Gene Condon. I own Condon and Sons Lumber, 117 East 25th, one of the older businesses in San Mateo. We've been there over 60 years. I want you to remember that this is a vision statement. 30 years ago, I started attending money, meetings for the grade separation, which is starting construction now. <laughs> Back then, we looked at gr trains going underground because we would have more room for parks, housing to use that, utilize that material on top. And back then, Joint Powers Board said, we have diesel trains, we can't do that. Now they have electric trains. Look at all that space that we lost because we lost our vision for 30 years in advance. So don't think for today, you need to think for tomorrow. Hence, when it comes to the housing, you've got to look at heights and density because something has to give because we're landlocked. We can only get so fat. We can only get, but we have heights in the TOD areas and those areas where you guys need to address to go taller in certain areas. That's the only way we can fit. That's the only way we can keep employees. I'm fortunate here where I'll be able to walk to work, but you can't do that in today's world. But please look for tomorrow. Look for 40 years in advance. Don't say no today. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, I just wanted to comment on the process that was described in the administrative report. Um, I went to one of the workshops and it was recorded, just as this is being recorded, as I believe all the workshops have been recorded, and none of those are available online. They're still all indicated as being to be posted. I mean, it doesn't take that long to post a city council meeting. I don't know quite why we can't post these. It would give you a better sense of what actually happened at some of these workshops because I know you couldn't possibly go to all of them. Although there were some people, I understand from others that I talked to, who did manage to get to every single workshop. Um, in most of the situations, the tables had to be um, put together even though it was a really good idea for how everything was to be made to work uh, with everybody sharing ideas. But when you start off with an assumption of 10 tables, 
tables as it was at mine, or I think 12, and then it got itself down to four tables. The best plans in the world of how people were to be divided up and share ideas and whatever just didn't lead to the kind of visioning input that I think you're looking for. Um, the other thing that, um, so I, I, I suggest that one of the things you want to do is ask for some, some data behind this um, 20 to 80 attendees per meeting. You don't have that many meetings. How many were at each one? How many were staff? You could even see the sign-in sheets and you'll be able to see that there were definitely people who came to virtually every meeting um, and, and spoke up, not just people who were observing as I know some of the people from the subcommittee did. So I think you need to get things up online so the public can see what those are like. I think you need to see exactly what kind of input went into the visioning process. And as I was looking through the voluminous material for this, um, I came upon a, a message that you got on November 9th from someone named uh, Nicholas. I don't know him from Adam, I have no idea, but um, I was struck by how much he was questioning the concept that all of this was being done on a good faith effort of people participating saying who they were, uh, taking their turn, um, not submitting multiple information, and how easy it would be to, um, to jury rig this process. And I believe that in a certain sense that is what has happened. So I think you need some more information before this becomes the final visioning statement. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Members of the subcommittee, <laughs> my name's Keith Weber. Um, noticeably absent from the draft vision statement are guiding principles and values that ground the community vision and from which the general plan can evolve. It, it reads less like a vision statement than a to-do list. And I know that we can do better as a community. Looking beyond the vision statement, the new general plan needs to build on the best parts of our current general plan. I have seen little evidence that this is part of the process. One aspect of particular importance is we need to strengthen the goals and policies regarding historic resource protection. First, the new plan must give historic resource preservation parity with other land use concerns such as housing, transportation, and jobs. Second, before buildings are torn down or altered, policymakers and the community at large deserve a clear data about which structures have potential historic value and if they have significance to the community. The 30-year-old resource survey, which was never fully completed, needs to be updated and finished. Third, 2019 marks San Mateo's 125th anniversary as an incorporated city. I would think this is something we should be proud of. What is the city doing to acknowledge and celebrate this fact? I wrote a guest perspective that outlines a lot of my thoughts. It appeared today in the San Mateo Daily Journal. If you've seen it, great. If you haven't, pick up a copy or check it out online. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Jan Stokely, Executive Director of Housing Choices. We support housing opportunities for people with disabilities. Um, I'd just like to thank the staff for all the work to include people in the community. Um, I participated in a really well-attended visioning workshop. I submitted my online comments. I sent emails. I got a personal phone call from staff asking for my help to reach out to families of adults and children with dis disabilities to include them. So I would like to acknowledge and thank the staff for that. Um, I think if you read the comments, you'll see that the overwhelming concern, the crisis here in San Mateo is around affordable housing. Um, and when you see a long list of items, housing, economy, jobs, it really doesn't do justice 
to the state that we're in now with respect to affordable housing. So I'd love to see the vision statement really emphasize that housing is at the crux of so many challenges San Mateo is facing. Um, secondly, I'd like to acknowledge that the vision statement addresses the need for housing for people of all ages, incomes, and abilities. Um, that was something that I wrote in my comments and I was glad to see that principle, that value statement captured. Um, I'm concerned, however, that while the, the housing comments emphasize the need for higher density, achieving the level of affordability that we're going to need to serve people who are earning under 50000 if they're a family or under 25000 if they're a single adult, is going to be really challenging if we don't address the issue of height. So I would love to see that particular provision amended to address the need not only for greater density, but also to address where are the parts of San Mateo where we can go higher. Um, but all in all, I was really happy to see many of my comments and comments from the people that I work with represented in the vision statement. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Adam Nugent. Thank you, everyone, for all the hard work in putting this together. Um, I appreciate everything that the city has done. Um, this is super important. I'm a landscape architect, former army officer. Uh, I took an oath when I was a farm, former army, when I was an army officer, and then also when I became a licensed landscape architect, um, I have to um, take an oath to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the people I serve, and that is what the general plan must also do, protect the health, safety, and welfare. So the health and welfare of the city uh, needs to be addressed, and that is most addressed in circulation housing uh, and sustainability. Um, I have some comments that I handed out for the general plan uh, statement. I wanted to note that for housing, it should be focused on housing. Um, and so it should look at how housing provides access to job opportunities less than just providing job opportunities at transit locations. So uh, I would just want to note that. Community life, um, I noted, needs to have a little bit more uh, explicit notes. Uh, for number eight, requires new development to incorporate high quality design and community amenities such as childcare and open space. Uh, we need to be careful that we don't block housing uh, and so, but also include these things that we need. So I recommend that for number eight, we say requires new development to incorporate high quality design based on easy to follow contextual standards while community amenities such as childcare, affordable homes, and open space are made more available and accessible as a result of new development. So that leaves the open for lots of different types of a development to be uh, provided for housing. Um, and then also number nine, we need to have it both look at the, f the future as well as the past. And number nine currently says, values the city's historic character, tree-lined streets, and well-maintained infrastructure. And what we should say is values and enriches the city's historic character, tree-lined streets, and well-maintained infrastructure. Excuse me, could you bring your comments to a close? Yes, you bet. Um, and then finally, uh, we need to make sure that we have safe streets. So let's say something explicitly in the parks and public spaces about that, because that's a big public space in our city. Thank you. OK, Michael Nash, and these will be followed by Peter Nagel. Hi, I'm Mike Nash. I'm a representative of the neighborhood associations and work very closely with Julia and the staff to organize many of the meetings that we just referenced there. So um, because of the limitations of time, I will be drafting a letter that I'll send in that will have more details, but principally I wanted to express some concerns for the procedures that were not followed in this exercise but were advertised in the workshop meetings. So for specifically, Julia made it clear at the meetings that it was to do vision statements, not solutions. Yet I read the vision statement that's presented here as an example, and it speaks to solutions. So it's clear that what people want is well 
well expressed in point one, housing for all types of ages, etc. But as soon as you move into you want to do that by facilitating high density housing, that was never discussed and it was, I think, misleading to have several meetings where you tell people not to discuss solutions, but then drop them into the vision state, statement. So I think that should be removed. Secondly, if you look at the actual count of people who talked about den density and housing, it's always wrapped in the notion is that we need affordable housing. That is a very clear message. The vast majority of comments specifically stated that. But when it comes to how you get there, though, there were a lot of people who talked about increasing density of housing, but it was always in the context of transit-oriented development, the need for sufficient infrastructure to support it, and localized in mostly in TOD, but also occasional messions, messages about El Camino and uh, downtown. So my concern with it is the transit-oriented development lacks the T. We don't have capacity in transit. So if we're going to put thousands of people added to the people that are coming onto the stream because of developments in San Carlos and Belmont and Redwood City, where are these people going to ride? So if we're depending on transit-oriented development, doesn't it make sense to make sure that we have transit to support it? Um, otherwise, we're painting a disaster. So I think it's very important that this be moved from the vision statement into the solution set and be properly analyzed for what it really means. What is transit-oriented development? What is the distance that transit agencies would like to have to define convenient transit? Does anyone here know? I'll tell you if it's I need to have here. you bring your comments to a close. Mm -hmm. I need to have you bring your comments okay. to a close. So Thank I'll you. move on. So I think it's important that we move the solutions to the solutions set and we recognize that a solution that can't be implemented is a lousy place to start for a, a, a draft uh, vision statement. I okay, think thank, in, thank you, Mike. All right, just one other point. We need a survey. There's considerable um, concern that this effort for outreach uh, address too few people with too strong opinions and it's not representative of what the city's people really think. We have to address that. Thank, Thank you. you. The next speaker is Pete Mandel, and he will be by Thank you. Uh, first of all, like the others, I'd like to compliment the, uh, Mr. Nash, Mr. Knox and his team. Um, you read through all those comments, how you possibly got a synthesis that was actually readable. Uh, congratulations, job well done. Um, and I appreciate also, um, Member uh, Lee, I appreciate the, their comments and the uh, alternative text. So I just I was going to focus on circulation. And this is all tweaking some of the words. But one of the things is, it keeps on referring to, um, you refer to motorized vehicles and re re refer to personal vehicles. I'd prefer to use the word automobile. A personal vehicle, that could be a Segway, it could be a bicycle, it could be an electric scooter. And we talk about bicycles, we talk about walking, we transit. Why don't we also say automobiles or personally owned automobiles? I think that's the mode we're really th thinking about, so I'd rather be specific. Similarly, it talks about safe and efficient. Well, that's motherhood and apple pie. Who can argue with that? But I'm not sure what the word efficient means. I would suggest we replace the word efficient with something like maintain uh, or enhance the travel times on the major thoroughfares on local streets. Efficient, I think, really is trying to say no congestion, no delays. And one way of measuring that is travel time. So I would suggest you encourage, reflect travel times. Um, in the alternate uh, version suggested by um, I think, I'm not sure if I should say commissioner or committee member Lee. It says um, it, it deleted the reference to cut through traffic on local streets. I think that's important. I think it should be in there because with waves and who knows what we're going to have over the next couple of years, if we don't say we try to, if we, if we traffic's going to find its own level, just like water does through a network. And if we don't try to prohibit or discourage um, increased traffic on local streets, it's not going to be well and not going to be good. So the last comment I had was, I've heard the word con contextual standards used a couple times. I'm not sure what that is. I was trying to Google the word contextual standards. And if we're going to use the word vision, I think we should be more specific. Because I think that the word 
any, many of us could read those words and interpret it the way we want. So it's just, I think the more specific we can be throughout, the better off we'll be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, uh, subcommittee members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Jordan Grimes. I'm a lifelong San Mateo resident in the 19th Avenue Park neighborhood. Um, I want to start off first by uh, saying a huge thank you to uh, staff, and not just planning staff, but Parks and Rec, Public Works, really everyone. Um, I went to a couple of these meetings and the presence there uh, from staff doing these things, you know, uh, off hours uh, on their weekends was was really incredible. Um, I especially want to thank you guys for putting on uh, with, I'm a member of One San Mateo, uh, and I want to thank everyone for uh, their work in helping get the uh, Latino event off the ground. Um, I think that was a really important uh, group of people to, uh, to hear speak as uh, we learned at the event none of the people in the room had ever attended a city-wide event before. Um, so those were, it was a group of people who had never had a chance to be heard. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of uh, the city and, and uh, just everyone for helping, get, helping to get that uh, going forward. Um, I did just want to talk a little bit about the fact that I don't think this plan is frankly bold enough. Um, we're seeing, uh, actually in the last few weeks, uh, cities finally embrace the concept of doing away with uh, single family home zoning. Uh, Minneapolis is doing it for their plan 2040, uh, and now it's being talked about in the entire state of Oregon as well. Um, I think it's something that we need to be talking about here, in, in addition to higher heights uh, for, for residential buildings and higher densities. Um, one last thing that I, that I want to mention, I, I know there are some people here who aren't happy with the representation uh, that was, that occurred, that they believe occurred during the process. Um, and frankly, I, I agree with them, although not, not in the same respect, of course. Um, four of the general plan meetings were co-hosted by SMUHA, which is the San Mateo United Homeowners Association. Um, homeowners in the city already have considerable more power, considerably more power than renters. Uh, 90% of all board and commission seats in San Mateo are comprised of homeowners. Our planning commission, uh, our city council, are entirely made up of homeowners. Uh, Could and you despite bring your this, comments to a close, please. Sure, renters make up uh, almost 50% of our population. Uh, I seriously hope that going forward, that will be a group that receives more representation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this is next is Maxine Turner, and then um, Robert. I have a couple of comments. One overall one is the frustration with the rushedness of the process and including having a meeting tonight when we all have lots of other things going on and I'm really pleased that people are showing how important this is by showing up uh, just before Christmas. The process that I've heard, and I went to a couple of meetings, one as a participant and two to really just hear other people's comments, a frustration with the framework, the way these things were divided because they all relate to one another and people were forced to pick and choose when they wanted to speak more holistically. I have also, and I apologize for the last, uh, the last minute input, have some changes similar to what Ammo put in her, and I'd just like to go over a couple of them. <coughs> Under housing, um, item one, I'd like to add a sentence that says, uh, not off only offering a range of housing types, but ensures that new higher density developments provide a variety of unit sizes to accommodate families, couples, and singles. And then I'd like to add a sentence, um, an item three under housing, 
ensure that new housing development and projected population increases can be accommodated by necessary circulation, school, and park infrastructure, whether existing or by specifically identified improvements. That's been a frustration, and everybody recognizes we need to grow more, but we need to be able to accommodate growth. Under item seven, where we have, um, has a variety of retail service, blah, blah, I think we want to change has to maintains a variety of retail service. And then I'd also like to add, um, recognize a new item recognizes downtown San Mateo as a focal point of the community due to its historic heritage and architecture as well as its pedestrian friendly mix of retail entertainment housing and commercial development could you bring your comments to a close please I will under nine instead of values the city's historic character protects the city's historic resources and character. I will give you my comments. I hope they will show up someplace uh, because as I said, it's really hard to keep up with the input. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Robert Whitehair. I've lived in San Mateo for most of 35 years, and I uh, applaud what the work that's gone into the vision statement. I think it's a good start of an aspirational goal. And I use the term aspirational goal because it does have to be specific. It does have to have some sort of things that you intend to do. It just can't be a good apple pie motherhood statement. It has to say things like height increases, and then what I like, and density increases. I'm asking that height be added to item number two. It says increased uh, density and height. Because I, if you do the math, and I have some experience with developing property, you can't get the number of units that we need. There's the studies of we, people here have talked about up to 14,000 more units needed in San Mateo. You just can't do it unless there's increased height. Um, I also want to talk about a personal story to kind of drive home how critical and how urgent the housing issue is. My wife and I recently did some work on our home and we looked around San Mateo and we were able to find a lot of craftspeople, contractors and subcontractors who live in San Mateo. We were frankly surprised. We didn't think we'd find that many. We thought we'd have to go to the East Bay or someplace else. And we did hire everybody who worked in San Mateo. We hired about six painters and electricians and what have you. And I got to talking to them, and the reason they're able to live here in San Mateo is because they've lived here for some years. They're in their 40s and 50s, some of them. And what's going to happen by 2040, they're all going to retire. So if we want to have a vibrant community of, of craftspeople, of low income, middle income, and moderate income, plus the people who can do the things that we need to have done, we're going to have to address the housing issue now, not in 2040 after all these fine people have retired. So thank you for your time and I applaud your efforts. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alex Melendrez. Uh, I'd like to reflect some of the words that the last speaker just mentioned. Uh, we can't get the number of units if we don't build higher. Uh, I'd like to thank you for using the phrase higher density uh, in the vision statement. However, there should be uh, an, include, an inclusion in the uh, plan to mention uh, that uh, we need to be able to build higher. Uh, the vision plan is a good step, but it won't, uh, it's not action oriented enough. I believe the vision statement should reflect on the urgency of the current housing crisis. Uh, while it's great to have additional density, it won't have any significance if we can't build higher. Uh, height restrictions on housing are not just restrictive, uh, they won't be able to meet the housing needs required for the additional growth that San Mateo is uh, seeking or predicted to have. Uh, I believe these statements should be reflected in the uh, vision plan, or general plan. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ken Abreu. Hey, I had sent a letter to you all and I just wanted to sort of 
build on those points. Uh, my, my wife and I just came back from visiting Singapore and I noticed some things there that I think are relevant and it relates to the higher density of housing. They have very high density housing, tall buildings near their transit stations. But not all the buildings are tall. Once the, the residential buildings are built, the things around it, which are things like stores and restaurants, the schools, they're all one or two stories, and there's parks, and of course there's the transit station. So you have these tall buildings, but you have these parks and then uh, other buildings in the area, and people walk to them. They walk all over the place. In fact, I talked to, I have some relatives there, they say only about 50% of the people in Singapore own a car because their transit station is there, and they've got the density at the station to support the grocery store, even the medical clinic, the school, and all that other sort of stuff. So I think that's just something to keep in mind as you move ahead. Thank you. <coughs> Matthew, Hi, I'm Matt Tacker. I'm a professional planner, architect, and, and uh, urban designer. And I've been asked by the owners of the uh, Hillsdale Shopping Center to uh, consider the general plan because the, uh, that area near the Hillsdale uh, station, you know, is, uh, I think can play a very important role. It actually has the transit service that uh, was, was talked about uh, earlier. Um, just, I want to just leave you with uh, two things. One, if you can go to this page. This is actually a word search that I did. I was curious. I didn't really know how this was going to turn out. I looked at the housing section of, uh, of the notes that you received. Um, and I just counted words that had to do with housing. And of course, housing affordability came out you know, twice as much as, as any other next most. Then diversity and variety. And interestingly, as many people uh, noted, transitory development in housing near transit. So I thought that was very interesting. And then coming up fourth was increased density in building height. So hopefully you might have learned something from that. And then if you switch the page then is just uh, an appeal to to treat the vision uh, statement as, as a kind of iterative exercise. And by that I mean you're going to learn some things, not just about uh, what folks uh, you know, throughout the community think the, the vision statement ought to be, but you're going to learn also some things about what actually fits uh, within your community and how it might fit, what the shape of it might be, what the land use and transportation pattern and framework ought to be. And that's actually going to shift some things in terms of your understanding of the vision statement uh, later on. And that's true for actually every step of the way, all the way to implementation. You're going to learn some things that's going to make you want to maybe go back and revisit something that's more general. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, this is Lori Laurie Watanuki. <clears throat> um, a few of my comments will be um, in addition to what I didn't see in, in the vision statements. Uh, number one, reduce cut through traffic not only on local streets but residential collectors and also pay attention to the pedestrian safety on residential arterials. So I think all three streets are very important in the residential neighborhoods. Also preservation of neighborhood character and historic properties. I think also to increase the inclusionary housing, the percentage of inclusionary housing, currently I think it's about 10%. In some areas it's, it's 15%. But I think you could incre increase that percentage on larger residential developments which will the inclusionary housing spreads the affordable housing uh, to all of San Mateo. Uh, we do not want to see affordable housing targeted to specific neighborhoods like Central or North Central, but it should be in all neighborhoods. We would like to, uh, to request developers pay traffic calming fees in um, for residential neighborhoods and install that traffic calming before the new project breaks ground. Expand more Caltrain services in the PM and on weekends to discourage car use. Reduce speeds on El Camino Real 3rd and 4th to 25 miles per hour. Reduce speeds on local and collectors to 15 and 20, 20 miles per hour in residential neighborhoods. Um, maintain quality of life and preservation of residential neighborhoods by requesting commercial trucks park in commercial areas. It would help clean up the blight of large 
when we see so many large commercial trucks on residential streets. It's important that we have pedestrian lighting over the 3rd and 4th Avenue overpass and to have more transparency on the number of traffic accidents that we have in the city of San Mateo, perhaps put this on a website, on a map, and, and keep it updated in real time. Um, these would are you, a few of the things. Would you bring and, your comments to and a Those close, are my please. comments, and I'll put that in writing. Thanks so much. Thank you, members of the subcommittee. This is quite a challenge and a project that uh, we're taking, but it's obviously necessary. I did attend one of the visioning meetings, and uh, I think what we're coming across is I, you know, we're in an area that, that's things are going around us that we don't have control of. I mean, this we've had a tsunami of prosperity in this area, and it's causing us to grow in extreme demand for, for the dirt that we have. Um, I used to work for a paper bag company, and one of the things we did was, for example, make a 20-pound paper bag. And a 20-pound paper bag can hold 20 pounds of sand, and that's it. And I think we need to take some of these considerations in our visioning that we don't overcrowd this area and negatively affect the quality of life. And one final thing is when I came out of the visioning meeting that we had, I thought of the 1973 movie with, with Charleston Heston called Soylent Green. And I hope that doesn't happen here. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Christine Velasquez. Um, I have been a resident of uh, San Mateo for about the past year um, in the Mariners Island area. And there's several reasons why um, I moved out to the area. I'm a runner, and so I really enjoy all the trails and the open spaces. Um, it's been um, uh, great, and I acknowledge the subcommittee for um, making the um, meeting notes um, available online um, to follow uh, where we're at with the general plan, uh, 2040. And um, I do appreciate um, uh, the priorities that have been included, of course, support affordable housing, um, which is not just a city issue, but a regional and statewide issue. Um, so I appreciate that being a priority and um, providing housing for all, um, or working toward that, um, as well as um, lowering the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, again, that's something that we all need to be responsible for. Um, going back to my running and um, open spaces and um, um, gathering places, um, my comments could fall under possibly under um, community life, parks and public spaces or even housing development where uh, perhaps there could be more placemaking type of um, development um, included in uh, perhaps new housing developments or activating um, spaces that are not fully utilized to increase that uh, community um, pride and um, sense of community. Um, and um, um, if that could be incorporated, I don't know if it's a, a zoning thing, but um, included in the general plan um, as developments are being developed and uh, possibly early on in the design phase um, to possibly um, design outward versus inward and um, including the community so that um, it's there's there's places for people to gather um, not for just for example that new uh, housing development and those residents there um, for but for everyone to enjoy so thank you thank you Next speaker, Leora Ross, and she will be followed by Tim Chomstad. Hey everyone, um, I'm Leora Ross. I'm here on behalf of the Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo County. I just handed you um, a red line copy of the draft vision statement. I thought that would be more efficient than uh, reading them to you. Um, 
I also wanted to tell you about the telephone town hall that we held on uh, Wednesday, December 12th. And it was to talk to San Mateo residents about affordable housing, transit, mobility, um, and environmental issues. So after uh, we and Greenbelt Alliance and the Silicon Valley Leadership Group had a discussion about all these things, we surveyed the people, the 1,100 residents who uh, dialed into this town hall. And here were the results of that survey. 62% of our participants know someone who's been displaced from San Mateo due to lack of affordable housing. 90% of participants agree that traffic congestion on major arteries is caused by too many commuters. 60% of participants believe that San Mateo should build more affordable housing, especially for teachers, nurses, and public safety workers. Uh, another, well, maybe the same, 60% of participants believe it's either important or very important that San Mateo build more housing near public transit hubs. And I thought that was pretty indicative of what we found um, through the, the general plan visioning process. Um, our offices are right on El Camino. Um, they're in the, the mid pen building across the street from Hillsdale. And I would say every day, five or six people come into the office and they're desperate. They, they want so badly to, to live in that building. And that building doesn't even have a wait list because it's closed because there's so much demand for, for people who want to live there. And so I, I know that this is a plan for the future, but I want it, we need it to reflect the, the crisis and the desperation that people are feeling right now. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Tim Tosca, and he will be followed by Susan. Well, good evening. I'm Tim Tosta, working with the Bohannon Development Group. Um, I think the, the, the problem we found historically with vision statements is they tend to um, hold you in too tightly to a set of, of words that, that as you further explore and, and you get into the process, you find that you want to go beyond the, the limitations, perhaps, of the, of the vision process. And that's one of the reasons why they become so banal and, and generalized. But um, I just want to um, support my colleague, uh, Matt Tacker, in that we think of vision statements as iterative. They are not supposed to end your inquiry. They're not supposed to suppress your creativity. I mean, after all, we had under 1,000 people participate in the city of 100,000, and they self-selected, and they had the time and the availability uh, there in their personal lives to be able to participate. That, is, that, is, that does draw its own kind of, of self-selection and, and limitation on views. The other thing that happens is, is uh, that the part we just finished is probably the part where they are beginning to understand planning. And as this process continues, they're going to find themselves more and more sophisticated as they learn more and more through the process. So there's a very good likelihood that people have different ideas three months from now than they had in the last two months. The other thing to understand, I've given you a Venn diagram, and I don't have time in two minutes to explain it, but I, I wish you would take your time to understand that cities are complex systems. That means they are not given to linear t sequences of thinking. And in a complex system, when you make a housing decision, you've effectively made a traffic decision. Or if you make a traffic decision, you've effectively made a greenhouse gas decision. So some of the problems with the, 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 the visioning is I don't think folks quite understand how complex and interrelated the system is. So I want, I want you to feel free to embrace all of the complexity that's coming your way. Would you bring and your comments to a close, please? God, two minutes is so different Very when I'm fast. standing in front of the mirror. Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to make... And, 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 I, and the reason for that is there's a sense of urgency here. This is and should be a disruptive <coughs> plan. It should be a way of looking at this community anew. The, um, you've said 10,000 units, or excuse me, the briefing book said you may need 10,000 units, but in the um, existing conditions report, if you look at the woods and pool work who forecasted jobs in the area, they actually, if you use their data, you get to the city needing 15,000 new housing units. That's a lot of housing. Thank you. So where thank are you, you going to put your it? Comments. And uh, I, we, uh, we need to move on. And, thank and you. Thank you. I've, I haven't been. That's it. 
Thank you. Next speaker is Susan Marwinski, and she will be followed. Sure, thank you. My name is Susan Rowinski. I'm a 20-year resident of the city of San Mateo. Um, while I'm a member of the um, Sustainability and Infrastructure Commission, my comments will not reflect that commission. However, uh, my comment to you tonight does have to do with item 12, sustainability. And I'm going to read this out. In 2040, San Mateo is a leader in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, mitigating and adapting to the effects of climate change, and building community resiliency. I would like the subcommittee to consider adding a, a, an additional comment of ensuring ample and high quality potable and non-potable water to our ever-growing population to the sustainability um, vision outlined in here. And let me explain to you why I believe that's the case. Our city right now has invested a billion dollars in a state-of-the-art water treatment plan, and it was a good decision. However, uh, that water treatment plant on a daily basis will return tens of millions of gallons of the most cleanest drinking water in the state back into the bay back into the bay so this committee should start thinking now for 2040 to plan a project to move some of that to move that tens of millions of gallons of clean drinking water um, back into our reservoirs for us to drink and use for other purposes and this is real. And in fact, it's so real in 2020, there's a state law that goes into effect that's going to be limiting water use per house to 55 gallons a day. You do the math on a 30-day month, and that's about 1,700 gallons a month. So once again, the, the speaker before me talked about this process needs to be disruptive. That's a disruptive project that has to start the planning now for 2040. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm just too short for everything. Uh, there, look at that. Um, hi, my name is Jean Dale. Um, I've lived in San Mateo about 35 years. Great place to be. Wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Um, I was able to get to one of the planning meetings for the community and unfortunately my note to you um, was sent a day later than it could get into your packet so I just thought I'd read out my comments and um, here goes thank you so much for doing this outreach very important to get residents input on current traffic building situation just wanted you to know that the city staff person who joined our group at the end of our session kind of took over the end of the group's activity of trying to come up with a vision mission statement. I think the staff should let the group build a final statement with as many ands as needed. Our group kind of ended up with a fluff circulation statement, whereas other groups really had very specific statement. For me, I think I cannot repeat this enough. The city council needs to wait until the current construction on Delaware is at full capacity before we approve any more building anywhere. The traffic mess we've got must be resolved with roadway improvements before we end up with gridlock not only at morning and evening rush hours, but potentially all day on the 19th Fashion Island Delaware corridors. I am active with San Mateans for Responsive Government, and Rick Benina, Diane Pappen, and Joe Gothis need to get on the same page as Eric Ronda Rodriguez and Maureen Frashen. I want to be able to go over to Bridgepoint at 3 p.m. without spending 30 to 45 minutes waiting in traffic. I can't imagine that that isn't the goal of all the members of our city council. I am sincerely requesting that city council reconsider their pledge to work with SMRG. I have to believe we all want responsible growth for San Mateo. We love the city we live in and want to keep its quality of li living as long as we can. Please, please, please keep up this active dialogue with us and see if we can't help each other to the future San Mateo we all want to live in. Thank you again for your hard work, patience, and willingness to hear the residents of San Mateo. I just want to remind all of you that SMRG did get 7,000 signatures on a petition for a measure that's been in place now for 30 years. It's not as if you haven't heard from the residents of San Mateo. I'm sorry. 
Um, and and I, we have to call time, so please yep. bring your comments so, to a close. Yep. So ju just remember you have had <laughs> 7,000 plus people signed a petition that have responded to what we thought we wanted San Mateo to look like in the future. Not saying that what you're doing isn't a good thing and that there may not be some changes, but you know, you have heard from at least 7,000 people. Thank you. Thank you. Too short. I know. Final speaker is Gloria Moreno. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Gloria, and I'm a lone resident of San Mateo and a renter. And I'm here speaking on behalf of renters. Uh, I'm here and speaking on behalf of renters who have been struggling for years. Our rent is still rising, people are still being evicted, and our representatives are not doing anything. I think this is more than just a for affordable housing issue. I think it's a, it's, this is a moral issue. People are living in their cars. People, people can barely afford to live here. They're working hard. Every year, our rent go higher. And especially Latinos. Latinos are living in rooms with four people in each room. African Americans and Latinos have the, the most people that have been evicted and cannot afford to live here. I think we need to see the faces of these people. We want to improve uh, education for younger kids. We'll see the faces of these kids. Many of these kids are living in cars and don't have a room. I mean, don't have a place to live and living in rooms with four people. If we want to improve the health for everyone here in the city, do you know the, the stress that is in us? that we can barely afford to pay our rent, that every year our rent go higher and our salaries don't increase. And if, if they do increase, our rent is, increases more than our salaries. So if we want to, really, if we want to improve, the, just not, let's not just see the buildings, see the faces and the life of people. So let's improve the life of everyone in the city, not just the people who gain more, make more money, but everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And that was the final slip. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for speaking tonight. Uh, I wanted to ask the committee if you have thoughts on how you'd like to go forward for our discussion. We have about 55 minutes. And would you like to address the problem by the different topics that were covered, like circulation, housing, sustainability, or would you rather make more blanket statements? I have a couple of overarching questions. Are they questions about the questions. process and the report? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, and so would, does that okay with everybody if we go ahead and have maybe a question period and then a discussion? That okay, okay, that sounds great. Okay. Emma, why don't you start? Okay, thank you. So I have a question um, for the staff and, and consultants about how the vision statement was um, was drafted and how um, things that are clearly disputed in our community like height, where there was many, um, many statements from the community in favor and also many in opposition, how that, how that was reconciled and included or not included um, in that specific example, I, I, I would like more background on. I also have a question about um, how the ordering of the elements and um, if the order is meant to, to illustrate a prioritization Okay, um, and then furthermore, if the value statement will be pulled together by a principal statement or, or, or some sort of additional statement that's, that talks about the need to integrate all of these elements together and, and treat them holistically. Um, and so I'm wondering if that's part of where we're trying to get to in the next process. So um, it was interesting to see the metric of, um, I think the Matt Tacker showed where he looked at words, just how the words showed up. And of course we have our, you've probably seen online, we have word walls 
of what people have posted. But the answer to the first part, I think, of the first question is we really try to take what we thought was consensus. And, and I think what we're, we're really hoping to hear from, from you from the subcommittee is if you feel like we've missed that somewhere or we overstated things or you don't like the words or um, you don't think it's accurate. And we went back through, you know, all of the, you know, everything that's listed in the, in the packet. So we, we took basically every piece of input from every individual and tried to find what we thought were the common threads that really stood out and then put them in a, in a cogent fashion that spoke to what we wanted people to, um, to focus on. And it's interesting because we heard tonight that some people said they're too action oriented and others said they should be more kind of hands off and, and really kind of set policy and, and not frame action. So there's really one of the challenges we faced in compiling them that I think will we will now hopefully, hopefully transfer you a little bit is what's the right balance? And, uh, and I think really the, the answer to, your, to all those questions combined is we really were looking for balance that we thought really represented what we heard from the community and really incorporated the breadth of what we heard but didn't let one individual, any one individual voice speak more than others um, and also not push others down. And so it, it's, it's, it, it is a, it's a very objective exercise when you start because you start with all these data points, you put them together, you see where they fall out, but there is some subjectivity and that's the reason we're doing this in this, in this forum tonight is so that you can hear what community members say when they react to what they've seen. You clearly have you know, a full range of opinions about what's here now and I think that's the difficult task is to try to see if we can take this, this first draft and turn it into something that you feel you can pass on to Planning Commission and Council that you, th you think is reflective of what we've heard. Can we see the questions being addressed I just wanted, I wasn't sure, have you totally answered the third question about the, the uh, a higher level, sort of like an umbrella vision statement? Is Are we aiming for a, another level on top of these one set of, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the very honest and transparent answer is no. Um, we, we received some feedback um, from community members and, and also I think it was our read that, that kind of the existing preamble that we have that's very kind of narrative is really hard to understand and, and doesn't frame. Even, even if you, you all decide it's too action oriented and we want to pull back and leave more room for, uh, for more, you know, more, more possibilities and less specificity, no, we, we, we did not, we did not, we purposely did not go towards a kind of like similar narrative, multi-paragraph narrative about all the things you might find in the city. Um, we kind of felt like the, the gist or the tenor of what we heard from the community was, tell us how this is going to be. Um, certainly a comment was made tonight that they're all, and a, and a Venn diagram, that they're all overlapping, no question about that. And so, you know, you could decide that the, that the, the categories, which, which were prioritized on purpose oh, in this yeah. order. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not that they have to be, but we really felt like, Again, going back to that metric, we felt like housing was the thing we heard about most, and then circulation. And, and so it, it, it's got a kind of a gentle intendance to be, to be written that way. But if, for example, you could take all of those subtitles out, and you would still have statements that still are all overlapping and still, we think, reflect what we heard. And let's jump down here. I have one question um, that I've heard uh, tonight from public comment and just in general. In terms of, you know, we're trying to create a vision statement for um, how we want our city to be in 2040. And it's a very difficult task because we have, um, I guess by some estimates, about a thousand people who have participated in this process. and. Um, you know, we're a city of over 100,000 people, as I think uh, Mr. Tosta mentioned. Um, what uh, the concerns that I'm, I'm hearing are that um, the, a lot of, how, in this whole workshop process, and especially on the online process, how is each individual opinion or statement weighed, and is there any, was there any um, balance put for whether or not um, somebody was actually um, like a resident of San Mateo, a business owner in San Mateo, versus um, an a versus various <laughs> advocacy groups and and basically other other folks who who definitely have a stake in what goes on in San Mateo but aren't necessarily a member of this community? Was there any distinction made there or? Well, so 
that kind of leads you into a couple places. One is the in-person exercise. We didn't make an attempt in the in-person exercises. People have self-identified and talk, spoke to each other and said, I'm a business owner or I'm a resident. And I think we even have people said, I'm not a resident, but I'm really interested and here's why. We've had folks come and identify themselves at other public forums like this and say, I don't live in San Mateo, but I work in San Mateo, or I'm part of an advocacy group that's really focusing on issues in San Mateo. We did in the online participation, which was almost 500 individual respondents, um, there was one section that you probably recall that says, if you'd like to identify yourself, please do. 138, I think, people identified themselves, and 130 of those were San Mateo residents. But you know that that that's not really necessarily indicative of whether or not the 484 responses were only from those 138 people, because there's no there's no way to connect that unless we tried to like break the code on IP addresses and figure out where every computer was, which is probably not the direction from from the from the um, subcommittee. But but my, my my point is people were very proud to identify themselves as San Mateans when they had the opportunity um, in multiple ways. Um, and I think most most likely a solid chunk, if not the majority of the input we've gotten, we believe is from San Mateo residents and business owners. But I think trying to prove that would be relatively difficult. Do, do you feel that this um, this sample of data we have um, would be representative of if we did like a random sample of average San Mateans? Well, and this goes to Mr. Nash's comment. I think you know to truly do a, a scientifically valid random sample is a is a different exercise, and there are you know there are colleague firms that we've worked with around the state that do that. Um, and, and, and I think that this gets at this difficult question of self-selection, right? It, this is, a, everyone who's out there should be congratulated. This is not easy, it's not an easy thing to do to make the time to come do this. It's, it's act actually, you're creating work for yourself that's much appreciated. And so if you do a random sample, um, you know, and you target the questions to things like, what would you like to see? They're gonna be very action oriented, right? You're not gonna get people just saying, are you interested in the subject? So it is certainly something that, that Council Planning Commission, General Plan Subcommittee could consider I, I think if, if I understand your question correctly, in my experience, having done a lot of general plans and, and many around the, the Bay, I would say we've gotten good participation. I think we've gotten a, a real coalescence of common ground and common threads. And I think that um, it's pretty safe to say that the kinds of ideas you see in the vision statement are, I think are truly representative of the community. Certainly as the last speaker said, there are some, some folks who are not, you know, not really gonna be fully represented in, in any way because of disadvantages they face and um, you know, and we've, I think we've really done a, a, a good job, we can always do better to try to reach into every um, group in the community. But I would say overall, um, unless we were very carefully framed exactly the information we wanted to try to get and really like compared ideas to each other, a random sample probably would yield you the same kind of information and I think it would be pretty consistent with what you've heard. Thank you. I just have one question about uh, what came up a couple times in public comment, this idea of having a, a more iterative visioning process, the, the opportunity to perhaps come back, uh, maybe not from the very beginning, of course, but uh, are, will there be opportunities as we go into later stages of the process to uh, at least bring up the idea of asking whether w certain vision statements could be uh, changed and uh, your, your thoughts on whether there's uh, time for that. I, I think there's time for it and I think, um, I mean to be fair to the to people who have suggested it's a relatively innovative idea. I mean typically in the general plan process the emphasis that's put on vision is let's decide what the vision is, that creates our guiding principles, you heard someone call it that and off we go. But I, but, but there, there, there's no reason why if we learn something later on and the subcommittee went back and said, we really think the Planning Commission and Council should think about changing the statement because now that we've learned something else, we think it could be better drafted. I, I don't see why that couldn't be done. Um, and that's, I think, one, one of the reasons why the process is set up so that the subcommittee, subcommittee makes comments um, for guidance and information and then Planning Commission and Council basically accept it. It's not an adopted project under CEQA or a, you know, adopted official document until the general plan is adopted because it becomes a statement that sits at the top of the general plan and informs the reader about everything that they're gonna, gonna learn through policy. So I don't see why we couldn't. Um, 
my guess would be it would be fine tuning as opposed to throw that one away and come up with something completely different. So sure. Charlie, I had a question about the um, report as a whole. <coughs> Am I correct that the subcommittee's comments from meeting number two were not included in any of the um, write-ups in the report? You mean as an attachment? Are you saying as an attachment, or are you saying when no, the subcommittee made, made considered as part of the input? Well, it, yes, it, it it was in that um, I think the charge and the discussion was framed by, as we listen to community input, what kind of comments do we have to add? And so we, I think we took into consideration what, communi what the committee members said about community input. Um, I, don't, I don't recall, um, I'd have to be, yeah. be reminded to go back, if, if a committee member said, I really want to change this to something else. Um, and oh, I think no, I was thinking about meeting number two where we right. were addressing the, um, there's a word for it. Existing conditions. Condi yeah, existing conditions. And we went um, oh, right. by e through each section. And there were quite a few comments that came out from that, from the subcommittee, that I didn't read in this report. So I just wondered when those were going to be included. So we have them. Um, so one thing that we were doing, I think one of the uh, members of the public mentioned the video. Um, we're going through the video and comparing. We have draft notes that staff and the consultants were typing during GPS2. So we're comparing the notes that we have with the video. And so that will be packaged. But we didn't have enough time to synthesize all the information that came from the visioning meetings, watch the videos, and finish the stuff. And there was a lot to do, and we didn't have enough uh, time to synthesize all of that. But I think. Um, you know, as mentioned, uh, this is iterative. Um, we, you know, what we're showing tonight, what Charlie has uh, shown in the presentation tonight, is one very sort of early version. As we get those information out, we will post it online, and it will be part of the materials that are presented to the planning commission at the next meeting. Okay. That was my question because I think that the um, that the subcommittee's comments were important in meeting number two, and I think the Planning Commission and the City Council should have those in their consideration. Okay, any other questions on what we heard? Thank you very much. First, I wanted to say uh, thank you to the staff and everybody involved, all of the members of the public who attended the visioning workshops. Uh, it sounds like you know, I didn't attend any of them because I wanted to wait and see what came out so that I could, you know, try and work with this information. And I really want to hear what the people have to say without, because I was the mayor, I didn't want to be distracting anything, okay? So uh, I'm impressed with the level of uh, 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 participation we had. Um, and, and I really, at reading through all of these uh, comments from all the members of the public, uh, I'm really touched. But I wanted to bring up one thing that has to do with what the last speaker spoke about, Gloria Moreno. Because I noticed that we did have an outreach in the Spanish-speaking community. Um, and they, what I saw, their comments were real, bottom-line, quality-of-life issues. I mean, serious issues that if more people in this city had, we'd really be laying into it. And yet, I don't see much. I'm, I'm looking at what we have here. In, in our draft general vision, general plan vision state, I see like uh, under number six, pay living wages. Well, that, that's kind of one of the things they were talking about. They actually said quite a few more things. But really what I'm looking for is like the word equity somewhere, because I think there's a whole group of people there, and they're a pretty good sized group of people in our city who uh, um, don't seem to get mentioned or really thought of that much. I want to make sure we remember to include the poorer uh, people who really work hard for very little pay and, ha and are having a very tough time trying to get by. So, thank you. So as we look at the vision statement and the list of um, all the subtopics, are there things that jump out to the committee members that you'd like to address? And um, whether it's language, whether it's are we on the right direction, and if you have things that jump out at you, would you bring them up? Ooh, I get to talk, okay, because I <laughs> didn't have any questions. Uh, and and I, I, I guess my one question, though, would be about at what point is words, wordsmithing particularly valuable? I mean, we've had some great comments, both from the public and from some other uh, committee members. Uh, 
you know, other than fighting over community resilience versus resiliency, <laughs> thanks to my fifth grade teacher, um, you know, I have I could mark this up too, but I just want to do it at the right time. Uh, do we have a timing on when that makes sense or the next substantive draft? Well, thanks, Charlie. I, I think if there are, I think if there are you know major issues where you really think something's missing, like um, Councilmember Bonilla mentioned equity, we have equitably, but I don't want to I didn't want to highlight it in direct response because it's really talking about um, you know recreational opportunities. Um, committee member Lee has suggested that we add community building into that statement, which is number. 11. But, but Charlie, I, I'm talking about wordsmithing rather than, right. than, than substantive gaps that right. want to be filled oh, with concepts. Um, yeah. Well, so, so I guess my question is, is that really, is that really wordsmithing? And, and I think the answer is, and I think you just jumped, beat me to it, is that ac actually with, council, or with committee member Lee's suggestion of community building, it takes what I think would have been a wordsmithing between equity and equitably and actually made it a content-related mm -hmm. comment, which I think is very valuable because I think um, it, it, it wasn't just the, the difference between the words, it was actually adding another concept that made that word more powerful and, and effective. So I, I think if it's just wordsmithing, like, you know, we have a run-on sentence or a, a misplaced modifier or something, I think that can be done by email. Um, I think, but I, w but I don't want to discount the fact that one word can be really important because one word in combination with another suggestion, I think, just became very important based on the comments I've heard. Right, I guess, I, I don't disagree with anything you say, I'm just, uh, I want to know when the timing of, of the input is appropriate. I think tonight you're going to hear not only what you've already heard, but we're going to hear, at least from me and I think some others, a few things that are missing that may need to go in here, and as well as some tweaks that will have both uh, form and substantive impact, potentially. Um, but then there could be just regular drafting. Is there going to be another version that's coming out that the committee no, will then play with that, before it goes to council and planning? That's probably a better question for me to answer. The 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 hope tonight is that the general plan subcommittee will be able to achieve some sufficient consensus or relative consensus to be able to say in general we like these things or don't like these or we want to change these. I think that individual members' comments about how to change the words or to add things or take them away will be as just as powerful as all the public input we've gotten when it goes to planning commission and council. So I, we were not intending to come back to this group again with, we heard you say this, now here's a new version. We were gonna say what we heard you say at the meeting was change these things and here's a possibility of what it could look like and then individual members may have additional more wordsmithing, more detailed ideas that will also go in the packet for planning commission and council. Over email. Uh, email's fine. Yeah. Okay, okay, I, I think I followed that. Uh, I won't be shy on email. Uh, the substantive areas that, that I found in, in reading this, well, one comment I'd like to make is that uh, uh, compared to the uh, vision statement for 2030, the prior one, this is far better. I, 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 I applaud the, the ordering and the uh, grouping. Uh, along the elements, it just is easier to read and makes more sense uh, whether you agree or disagree with the actual elements themselves. Uh, as the, the old one was a, a little bit more all over the place, so I think that's good. Uh, I had three things that I thought were missing, and I want to make it clear uh, to everybody that uh, by adding these things or suggesting that they be added, that I don't intend to impair or diminish what's actually in there. Some of these are potentially competing, uh, but what's in there is great, but I think there's some other issues that need to be uh, uh, addressed. Uh, in housing, for example, I applaud the affordability, the higher density, I think height does probably need to go in there. But what I didn't see in here is anything regarding quality of neighborhoods. Uh, and I think there's a considerable part of our residents that want to make sure that uh, you know the plan is not to plow over uh, re uh, single-family residents uh, and, uh, and and turn them all into condos uh, and nobody is talking about that so uh, you know something along the lines of uh, uh, you know protecting quality of existing neighborhoods and improving them would make some sense uh, uh, on circulation, and uh, I w one of the meetings I went to was an individual who we had an, a very uh, productive discussion on this. I think also what's missing, what's in there is great, but what seems to be missing is uh, improving traffic flows, reducing congestion, uh, improving travel times, I think is the more professional 
uh, term that I've learned. Uh, because I think that is a, a vision that we need to have. Cause we have to recognize, as much as we hope we're all, uh, uh, you know, flying in, in uh, uh, levitating in uh, in 30 years we're, or 20 years, we're probably not. They're probably still going to be cars. Uh, so we, we need to uh, to keep that in in the vision. Uh, something missing here that's uh, uh, that was in the prior vision statement is a uh, uh, at least I didn't see it was just on diversity generally. Uh, I thought that was a vision for the city is maintaining and increasing our diversity. I think that's a value that everybody uh, uh, respects. Uh, and uh, I could give you some language on that, but I think uh, I think the old vision statement had a pretty good one about people of all ages, and ethnicity, et cetera, income should be in their uh, groups. Uh, and then lastly, and this one's uh, small, uh, but it's one of those uh, uh, things that jumps out to me, and I uh, admit that you know my eight years on Parks and Rec way back when uh, gives this to me. And item 10, the idea of public art being before Parks and Rec, uh, I think uh, not to diminish uh, public art, but it's a relatively small part of the city, and parks and recreation are a huge part of what this city has and should have in 20 years, and public art maybe should be uh, a little bit down the line. And uh, those are my comments. Yeah. Are we just going through all of our comments at what time? Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, so I, for me, uh, at a high level, um, I, while I really applaud the city and I deeply appreciate all the people who came out and the effort that, that this all culminated to, I, I feel personally like um, I would have really benefited from having the videos of the meetings. I attended as many as I could, but for us as the subcommittee members, our mandate is really to help be a, a channel to synthesize what we're hearing and and echo that back in in a way that you know makes sense so we could move this process forward without having access to those videos um, without having answers to the questions that we asked um, in the last meeting I feel really impaired um, moving forward in this process and um, and it makes me really nervous about the pace that we're moving at, um, and I I strongly believe that words matter. I, these are the most important words that will matter in you know in 2040, and and get us to 2040. And so, I I am advocating that we slow down, um, and that we give ourselves some time to really get this vision statement right. From at a high level, I feel like we got some of the way there, but I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't, I didn't feel it was aspirational enough for me. And I think part of what was missing was that there wasn't that umbrella statement of principle. Um, there wasn't that statement saying that th everything is part of a, a, an ecosystem that does need to work together, that we can't look at these, these individual elements in silos. Um, and and without some sort of statement bringing bringing that to bear and talking about even the ordering that this is an important ordering that reflects the housing crisis um, that we're in currently, without any context at a principal level um, and without the information to to say that I really truly did hear and read every single comment that was made available to me, I can't say that I can move forward with um, you know knowing that I, I have truly heard what I what I do feel like I need to hear that being said <laughs> um, I'm trying to do my homework and so I did <laughs> do a draft um, it is available um, for everybody for me uh, I want to say straight away you know this these are thoughts to date acknowledging the information that has been missed in the process. Um, I fully um, 
I fully take in all the comments and I'm learning and I don't, this is nothing is set in stone. So for me, um, uh, at a high level, I, I hope, I don't think it makes sense to go through every single thing, but at a high level, um, I wanted to see the language be more, um, more aspirational, more, more active oriented. Um, I, I wanted to see more about health and safety and diversity, um, inclusion and like, accessibility. Those were really important things. The, um, and yeah, I mean, I could go through each one, but I'm not sure how, how, how I, it would just take a long time. How, what do you think? Yeah. I, I think like I, for one, really appreciate your comments on, on the speed at which we're moving and whether or not we want to have a an aspirational statement. I think that's very, very important because there are a lot of things that started popping into my head when I was going through each one of these. For example, I don't see any mention of schools. And we're going to build high density housing in here. Our schools are overcrowded as it is. And where are these kids going to go to school? So if we have to build more schools, that means we have to have more bonds, which means higher taxes. And how is that going to affect those in our community that are struggling to make ends meet and, and afford rent, let alone um, increasing rents and increasing taxes. So that was what popped into my head as I was reading through. And, and um, Susan Rowinski brought up the natural resources that we sort of need to plan for. Are we going to have water for everyone in a state that it lives with droughts on a regular basis? Safety popped in to so many people's comments. And it was very interesting for me to read through the comments and pick that out on each page. It is, a, it is a real concern. And people want to feel safe, and they like feeling safe in San Mateo. So that's something that we need to address as well. Um, I think it's important that we also identify more of the urban forest, which was trees and, and greenery. That was a huge thing that came out in the comments, too, that people really liked living here because it was a beautiful place to live. And also, I would like to see more comments on the historical buildings um, throughout the city and preserving those and making that a part of our vision statement, as well as new buildings. I think there's a place for everything here. Um, I'm going to ask the committee how they feel about the speed at which we're traveling. If they would like to have a more cohesive statement to the Planning Commission prepared before it goes to them. Um, does anyone have thoughts on that? Well, I'll just start by saying I agree 100% with everything Amaris just said before she started going into uh, a little bit on her high-level thoughts. Uh, I probably agree with those two. But um, <laughs> I, I, I would just say that, I mean, clearly it's 735 or something um, in the you know in the framework we're currently working in we have 25 minutes to give our comments on what we've read um, and so I would at least in that framework ask that we be given a little bit of time to do that as best as we possibly can today but I will just say that this is clearly not enough time to really come up with something that I would feel comfortable giving to the Planning Commission after the end of tonight. Uh, what, would, what would make you comfortable? Well, um, I, I, I think uh, Committee Member Lee mentioned uh, having, having a bit more time, getting, getting all the information together, uh, and, and for, frankly, if we had another hour, for example, I, I do think the two-hour meeting structure is, is limiting. I want the public to get their opportunity to give us their thoughts on what, we, you know, what was given to everybody about a week ago. Um, 
but I want us to also have an opportunity to really dig into this document together as a group. So, uh, you know, I think sort of in line with the theme of, of the vision, not necessarily advocating for super specific solutions, I, I feel like in general, having a bit more time to have the committee dig into the process uh, would be great. If, if that means I come up with a draft, not unlike committee member Lee, uh, and submit that and everybody feels compelled to take a, a digger deep, uh, deeper dive after perhaps receiving a bit more uh, and submitting each of those and perhaps you know I, I don't know I'm guessing there's not an opportunity for a meeting in between uh, the scheduled Planning Commission meeting and now but something like that would be appreciated um, if, if I may through the chair um, so a couple of things. Um, so the committee itself is not charged with coming up with one set of recommendations um, regarding the, you know, the individual vision statement. Nor is the committee uh, charged with um, reaching consensus. I think you know there's a, a range of public um, sort of sentiments and thoughts and values. Um, each individual committee member, um, are, you're probably speaking to community members at large. People are approaching you, sharing their information. I think you know I saw Adam at multiple you know of the meetings, and you you probably heard from a lot of community members as well. And so I think you know the value. Um, I think Ammo with the um, draft, um, you know comments that she submitted tonight. It, it's a good way of putting it into words. You know what. Uh, you've seen, but also synthesizing some of the comments and things like that that you've heard from community members who have talked to you. Um, because as a group, the GPS is not charged with making a recommendation to the Planning Commission. I think the best form for each member is to share your comments tonight, you know, individually. If there are questions about the process, you know, certainly, you know, make that part of the record. I, we, we hear, you know, comments and concerns about the pace of this. Certainly make that comment if you agree with that. Um, but it, regarding the actual vision statements and the draft vision statements. I think after you've heard tonight, if you are interested in submitting, you know, similar to what AMO did, um, your your recommendations and have that be included as part of the record going to planning commission, that would be great. Can I ask a follow-up about that? Yes. Here. Um, I would be happy to rework my homework um, and resubmit. Can I ask that we have the videos available and the answers to our question from the last meeting before we, and then have time to process them and then integrate that information as well? So, um, so this is a staff's responsibility. Um, we are, after tonight's meeting, we'll be able to focus a little bit more on taking all the notes from GPS meeting number two, uh, re-watching that video. I've already watched it once just to make sure that the words that people are speaking are, you know, based, are loud enough that you can hear it when you're watching the video. I did not listen to it for content and comparing it with the notes. So that, that's something that we're going to do next. Um, in addition to that, I just for the record, um, as I was working with uh, Smuha and Congregational Church, um, we did not record every single meeting. Uh, it was not part of the original budget for the project. Uh, the council directed that the GPS two meetings, uh, the. G <laughs> The subcommittee meetings be recorded. Typically, city committee meetings are also not recorded, so this was an added cost to the general plan update effort. The additional meetings that we held, um, I tried recording on my iPhone, but we certainly didn't have the budget for recording. However, you know, just so that you know, um, the folks that got up from each group to speak, they were asked to read from the statements that were written by the group. So if they were doing their job correctly as you know, spokesman for that table, they should have read from the statement cards rather than inputting their own thoughts and sentiments into into you know what the group came up with. So that's just you know a, a commentary. I think but oh, we, then there's uh, one other piece of that was the comment questions and comments on the existing conditions reports. So barring another similarly monumental effort to like recreate them or revise them or reissue them our approach to those questions is to really try to answer them so that they become information that informs the whole process. My view of how they're going to be valuable is in implementing the vision statement, implementing the guiding principles, implementing the, the policies you want to see with what, what we do. 
And so I'm not saying it's not important to get those questions answered, and we are working on the answers, but I don't think the answers to the questions about existing conditions actually significantly affect what you want to see in the vision statements. In other words, if traffic is bad and housing is expensive, how expensive it is and what those projections were and whether it was a 2030 projection or 2040, which is what a lot of those questions were like, is probably not going to be materially important to changing a word or two that you think is, should be in a vision statement. So I just want to be clear and transparent that I was, we were not expecting that the answers to questions about existing conditions were going to be essential to what you thought about the vision statements themselves, per se. We thought it was going to be essential to helping to frame goals, policies, and actions about what to do about these issues in the future. And I think, and, and Julia can talk about this more, but I think the issue that we've been talking around with the video is this, this is just not the standard. It's not like using Granicus and the, no, the normal video process where we have everything set up in the council chambers and we take the video and out it comes in here's the process. This is much more difficult and I really want to actually applaud Cameron who's, who's been doing a great job of using this kind of setup to try to capture all of us, including my mumbling and, and you know, everyone holding the, the, the microphone at a different level. So we are working on both those things diligently. Um, but I just want to be clear, existing conditions answers, although they will be extremely important, we were not thinking you needed to know to be able to comment on the vision statements. Regardless, um, I think what we're trying to do is making sure that the next part of it is just making sure that the videos for all the, the only two other meeting videos that we have is the meetings of November 3rd. Those were actually, Cameron was at those two meetings and we recorded those. So our first charge is to get all of those videos on, on the website. And then the second charge is to you know, basically go through all our notes from that. So we will be working on that and once that's available then we'll post it online. We'll send an email out to everybody who has signed up, let them know. Certainly if you feel more comfortable waiting until all of that is done before you turn in you know, your uh, revise, that's fine too. Okay, but we are working on that after time. Okay. Okay. Thank you both. Uh, Ellen gave me the microphone again, so I, I'm going to move into my comments. Um, I, I will just say I, I pretty much accept what, what Charlie was just mentioning and Julia. I, I, I think to, to clarify my earlier statement as best I can, as quickly as I can, I, I, I think I'm just feeling a general, uh, I, I'm, I'm feeling uh, how, how much material there is and, and trying to wrap my head around it. I feel like I've basically been able to get a sense of whether the, the draft vision statement corresponds with what we got from the workshops. And then I, I, a little bit beyond that, I, I guess it would have been, I was sort of yeah, hoping there might be a little more time to think through it, and it sounds like I'll get an opportunity to think a little more through it and, and submit something later. So with that in mind, I will just try my best to run through this. Uh, first of all, I appreciated uh, Amundsen's question to Charlie about the priorities that were reflected in the ordering of the statements, because that was not immediately clear to me. Um, and uh, I may have a comment about that. I think one hint would be that sustainability should probably not be last. <laughs> um, and, and maybe I will start from there, because I think I have a quick high-level thought about the vision statements altogether, which Amma sort of mentioned in her draft and some of her comments. Overall, I, I did sort of sense that the, this draft, these draft statements do accurately reflect a lot of what I think we got from the workshops. And I think there was some good care in making sure that you know, certain pieces that may have not been seen as super high priorities to all were still reflected at least with a little bit of wording in, in most of the statements. I felt like a, a decent uh, breadth of what we got from the workshops is covered here. However, I, I also feel that it feels like a to-do list, as somebody uh, in, in the public mentioned earlier. Um, it's it's, it's a, a bunch of statements that seem to reflect what we got, but don't necessarily, um, uh, you know, acknowledge one another a lot. It, it, I think we definitely want, I, I, my feeling as I read these was, I think it's, you know, I almost wondered if there was a, an effort to, be as concise with the wording as possible and avoid 
uh, having statements sound similar when in fact I as a layman you know I think if a layman were to read what's the general vision of the city of San Mateo um, I, I think it would be better and make more sense and uh, and say more to have the statements acknowledge one another and and you know imply or sometimes even explicate um, how they are connected and uh, so I guess like for example you know to me su <laughs> sustainability is is very important um, we just you know since we got started with this process we had and the UN IPCC report mentioned that we essentially have 10 to 12 years to figure things out and I, and I really feel that if we don't figure those things out and if sustainability is the last priority in this general plan um, a lot of the rest is probably not going to work out or matter as much um, so and, and, and I, but I think the good news is, um, and, and, and I think that's reflective, I, I think there were some public comments that mentioned too that uh, people, because we have an emergent housing crisis and because circulation is so choked right now, you know, those are the two big elements of the general plan that clearly to people today need uh, you know, some, some, some wordsmithing if you will. Uh, but that that doesn't mean the others aren't important as well. And um, and to me, I, I think actually uh, sustainability could be at the end, uh, but it wouldn't necessarily be the lowest priority. What I, I kind of liked about sustainability being at the end is there was sort of a reminder like, and by the way, all of this is connected <laughs> in that we have a mission. And, and I, I think another piece I just want to point out on high level stuff is that, uh, whether people are feeling it today or not, um, this is going to be a huge part of what San Mateo will be like in 2040. <laughs> and um, so while we definitely want to hit various notes on housing and circulation because those are things we want to tackle, it's very important. Um, other, you know, because we need more housing, because rents are high, because traffic is bad now, um, all of those also have a sustainability element. You know, we, we want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as much as possible. And Adam, uh, a lot of those fit in, yeah. Through the chair, can I add one thing? So hopefully it's a distinction with a difference and not without a difference, but priority is probably not the right word to use. And I'm not sure popularity is the right word to use either. I go back to the metric table we got. It's frequency. So I don't think anyone thinks sustainability is last. But what happened is they're, the, they're in the order in which they received the most attention and the most response and the most comment. And so I think priority is probably a very loaded word not, that we should purposely not use. They're not an order of priority. They're, the, they're in the order that they were most frequently mentioned and, and, and came up. And so that's that's hopefully a, a, a good explanation because nothing can be last and really if you just look at the first three you know housing circulation jobs and economy that's what we heard the most but but we also heard the rest and not infrequently we heard a lot of comments about it okay thanks um, I want to make a few comments not too much because looking at the hour but I'd like to say that I, I agree um, and thinking about sustainability with what Adam just said about all of that, uh, the bottom line is that, in fact, practically all of the other issues we're talking about here do come out somehow and add up to seeking to cut greenhouse gas emissions. Modern construction uses less resources and cuts greenhouse gas emissions. It uses less water because you have low flow toilets and you have modern appliances that use less water to wash your dishes and wash your laundry. Okay, um, And the building itself is built more efficiency so it uses less energy for heating and cooling. All of which, all of these things now by the way can be done with 100% renewable energy. Uh, electricity, that is, electricity. Um, and so um, I'd like to see that receive uh, maybe just some kind of a higher standing. But I'd like to uh, uh, add, I did hear the mentions about the historical context of some parts of our city, and I think we should acknowledge that a little more. And, and it, it needs to be in here under um, maybe community life, 
I think, uh, some reflection of how we value the historical context of our city. Um, you know, I saw several of the comments talk about access to medical care and afford affordable medical care. Was that something, I forget, was that something we addressed under the existing conditions? Because if it wasn't, there seem to be a lot of people around who, who feel like they're not having good access to affordable health care. And I'm wondering if we could get that in there somehow. Uh, and maybe we could even check the existing condition on that. Um, because I think it's very important. We don't want people going without access to uh, not only health care, but affordable health care. Um, regarding the recording, to record or not to record, I wish I would have known, because then I would have sought to see if we could get more money. I had assumed all these things were going to be recorded. Okay, so I mean, um, sitting where I sit in the council seat, I could have sought to add something to the budget to cover that. Um, so I, I um, uh, if we have anything further, I'm, I am going to talk with the city manager and try to make sure we do get that covered. Um, and finally, um, I'll be sending my comments regarding uh, my proposed revisions by email also. And let somebody else talk. The categories were weighed by what was most mentioned. I understand that you only had one Spanish-speaking um, workshop and you had three non-Spanish-speaking workshops. How were the non-Spanish-speaking workshops um, categorized? How were they weighted against the non-speaking workshops? I understand that some of their, sure. some of their issues might be um, fought different into um, other categories. So again, being totally transparent, we were, all, we were already pretty far into coalescing the other comments we'd gotten first when some of the later workshops happened, including some of the neighborhood workshops and the Spanish speaking. So we really looked for, did anything completely new and different come up? And what did come up, where did it go? And so you'll see there are statements like living wages, and that one, living wages as a statement came from the Spanish speaking workshop and informed that, that um, comment. We also had a lot, of, a lot of comments about affordability of housing. And so not necessarily parsing the renter owner issue per se, um, those statements got stronger. Um, there was just, a, you'll see when you look through the info online and in the packet, just a lot of what came through the Spanish speaking workshop is just what we heard from Ms. Moreno at the end. It's just, it's really expensive when the rents go up. It doesn't, it's not commensurate with the wage increases. Um, you know, it's, it's really, there's overcrowding, there's substandard conditions, et cetera. So we, to, to, to answer just your question about the Spanish speaking workshop, it basically informed what we were working on already and made a lot of those statements stronger or more dynamic. Um, okay, so whatever the, um, so if they had their order a little bit more differently, then it, it would not have skewed any of the other. No, no housing was, okay. still number, was still number one. I, okay. it, I mean, it, I, think, I think if we only took that one sample of the Spanish speaking workshop, I think jobs and economy would be above circulation. Yes, and, and that was my question, is like, um, they preferred more jobs in the economy rather than um, circulation, but, uh, so. But the, Spani the Spanish speakers still had a, a lot to say about traffic and congestion and circulation. Um, and then my other comments was, I do concur with some of the other um, committee members. There are other um, and things here that are included, which is schools, education, um, healthcare, and quality of life that we also have to include in this. If you're looking more aspirational, looking in, 20, in 2040, um, then if we are looking to increase housing, how does that increase um, education, schools, how does that increase traffic, um, and also how does it increase um, looking at our seniors? It's just not, if we're looking at this more towards the future, I'm like, we do have individuals who are going to be aging out um, and will be um, senior individuals. How is, does that include it referenced in here as well? Um, so, and then I also will be sending my comments, um, suggestions in the email. So I left you two minutes, Eric. Good job. Thanks. Um, first off, I'd, um, I want to say I agree with um, many, if not all, of um, the comment, the sustainability comments made by um, Member Lorraine here. Um, there were two, I, I whittled down uh, about about eight comments that I had to the two most important things that I think were missing. I think this, this uh, v draft vision statement did an excellent job of capturing what we heard at these workshops. And I think that they, they specifically did an excellent job of, of um, verbalizing how how acute our housing crisis is. Um, not to diminish that in any way, um, I do 
have uh, share some concerns that I believe um, subcommittee member um, Robbins brought up in that uh, I, I was a little bit taken aback when I didn't see the word um, neighborhood mentioned once in in the vision statement um, eight years ago when the previous vision statement was was um, adopted um, I believe that the the word neighborhood was mentioned five times and um, you know words are important and I think that these this these um, vision statement is is supposed to show our, our shared values of what our community holds dear and time and time again um, our neighborhoods are are kind of the foundation or for what I hear is the foundation of our community so I think we need to somehow figure out how to incorporate that those sentiments in the vision statement um, again not taking away from anything else but just adding um, and then kind of segues into the discussion of you know everybody here in this room I think knows that we need to build more housing especially affordable housing but one thing that I do not I didn't see it directly addressed was our city's commitment to mitigate the impacts of that housing and you know we we, we talked about cut through traffic um, there was there was nothing about um, neighborhood parking issues mentioned and again I don't think we need to add a to-do list but I think that that mentioning somewhere that we are going to do our best to make it feasible to create this housing is going to be very, very important. So that was something I thought was missed. Uh, and I will be also sending my comments in. Okay, so let's just... <laughs> Can I add one more thing? Um, because I think it needs to be known, the City Council is current working on addressing <laughs> Uh, renter assistance measures which uh, we have been trying to work on for quite some time it seems to be a very controversial issue um, and speaking of outside groups that like to come and get involved we have some very large outside groups that are getting involved in a very serious way um, uh, uh, who seem to think they're getting paid to make sure we don't do anything to help the renters so I just want to share that thanks Okay, so our to-do list is that we are all going to submit emails of our comments and thoughts on the vision statement. Um, maybe, Julia, you and I can chat about more time, more uh, cohesive input by the committee. And um, then our next meeting is in January. So currently, uh, the next meeting, I think, is conflicting with the Planning Commission date. So Wednesday, the standing meeting for 2019, I think we had indicated uh, with the committee was uh, to be the fourth Wednesday of each month. However, the Planning Commission schedule um, is actually going to be on the same date. So we're not going to hold a GPS meeting on in January. Um, what we're, we are working on is a bus tour that's going to be on Wednesday, uh, January 16th. And so I think for the events in January, it's going to focus on that. Um, so the Planning Commission study session, we we can talk about you know the timing and overall. I think uh, the chair, Ellen, and I can talk offline about that, and um, we can share information once we have you know dates, 2019 dates for the Planning Commission study session and City Council study session. So then the input from the committee will affect this vision statement. How? So. Uh, the, the presentation um, will basically include what has been synthesized here um, and also the comments, the written comments that are provided uh, by the GPS uh, and also the video will include, you know, so the Planning Commission can watch the video from tonight. So our, by then, by 2019, whenever we do the study session with the Planning Commission, this video will be online. Okay, so you're saying what we're looking at right here mm -hmm. is what's going to the Planning Commission, whether mm -hmm. we agree with everything or not, and then the comments that are being submitted by the committee are just going to be an, a, an attachment? So, I, I, the, the answer is yes, but not, not, that's not how I would frame it. So, the, an, the answer is this is what we started with. And we had, we had public comments, uh, Mr. Nugent and maybe another person actually did the same kind of thing, like attract changes. And so this, this will have 
only the power of the first draft and anything that we get um, from the subcommittee members as well as public comment will also be included but I think we will try to take it we'll try to take a shot at analyzing whether or not the subcommittee's comments could somehow be you know coalesced and, and and made into a new version and I need to talk to Julie about how to do that but I think that you know the 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 role of the committee, subcommittee in trying to pass along information that the Planning Commission and Council can use to make decisions about whether to include, it, it does have somewhat of an elevated status and I, I would like to try to have a chance with whatever time we have to try to see what we get from you and see if we can make some suggestions that you would also be able to analyze and you know comment on about how to, how to put that together. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't so I wouldn't just characterize it as that's all just going to be listed afterwards. Mm -hmm. And then what do you see the Planning Commission's job as being when they receive all this in January? Um, to have a very similar discussion um, and to say we like these ideas, we don't like these ideas, let's include this and then pass that along to the council. And, and, and for the council staff report, we will try to have a singular recommendation from the staff consultant team if, if that seems possible. I mean, there's, there's a, I think there's, I think one way to look at it is there's a series of minority opinions, but I actually think that a lot of you are starting to say the same things about how you would want to see this first draft changed, and I think we, I, I'm, I'm hopeful we would be able to, to offer something that people will still have comments on and still, it's not going to be perfect for anybody, but I think that's part of what makes a consensus a relative consensus is it does reflect the breadth of opinion. So we're, we're going we're gonna to try to head for a council meeting with a recommendation that we think reflects what we've heard from the community, the general plan subcommittee, and then hopefully the planning commission also. If I may re relate that back to a similar thing that, um, so development projects, you know, a development project, you know, you go to an informal neighborhood meeting and then the uh, project developer shows their version. Um, they'll hear neighborhood comments and then tweak the design a little bit maybe and then it goes to planning commission's study session. Then based on the commission's comments and suggestions, it'll get tweaked a little bit more and then it'll get come back. So each time that we, you know, we, this doesn't go away, it's part of the record. Um, your comments tonight is, is part of the record as well, and then your written comments are also part of the record. And what staff and consultants do, we'll try to tweak that further and refine it. So each it is iterative. As you know, each set of comments come in, you know, it will get changed a little bit further. She, she, she stole my thunder, which is the iterative process has begun. Okay. Um, we appreciate everybody's input, and the meeting is adjourned.